Hello everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays, a weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. So, compared to last week, a few things are different. I took some of the feedback for the new setup, and uh, some people had some feedback regarding my size on the screen, regarding the size of the question on the screen, regarding my position on the screen. So uh, I decided to move a few things around, uh, use a different background, so uh, that way, you know, it's not like my chair is being clipped, it's more like my chair is just, you know, whatever, is uh, is actually facing the back. Although it does have this little thing right here. I mean, no matter what, I can only fit so much into this, like, rectangle that is my camera. Um, also, the questions are going to be bigger, and I did get some feedback about spoiler questions. I will not show those on screen from now on, as long as, I've, if I've read the question ahead of time, I'll know to do it. If not... I'll have to kind of just see the question as I'm reading it. Because most of the time I just look at the first line and go, okay, this question. Like, that's usually how I decide it. So anyway, uh, let's get right into the questions. Again, feedback regarding this new type of setup. Uh, if you have any recommendations for, like, maybe something I could put, like, right here past where this square is. Like, I don't want to put another me past where this square is. Maybe I could have a little, like, sly drawing that, like, I add comment. Like, you'd be like... Yo, fuck that shit. Or something like that. I mean, for whatever my answer is to the question. Whatever. I don't know. I'll have to think of something. But, uh, of course, continue to give me your feedback on the changes to the show. And, as per usual, let's get right into the questions. Alright, first question. Surprise! I'm back. Repost from week 56. You better not ignore me again. And here's a donation of 100 SOs. I need that on my alt, so thank you. Uh, my question is, what changes do you think uh, the gear system in 14 needs? I was watching LBR episode 27. Great show. And the idea hit home where somebody stated they should be rare gear that has unique traits set bonuses etc that may be sellable as well should be in the game over what i was thinking was adding rare drops like 0.5 percent to the last two floors of a3 and a4 it should be something like boots or a headpiece which give unique traits and stats at considerable item level for example ninja feet which are i230 use armor crush hutan extends for 40 seconds instead of 30 so uh i've actually commented on gear changes a lot in the past i want to see more unique stats on gear of course i don't think you should put an i230 boots at the in the middle of a, an i210 rating tier but something along those lines uh, here's a few, here's a list of a few things i want for one unique traits and set bonuses i've agreed with lbr on this in the past and i've discussed it with them in the past and we both completely agree that would make loot choices it would also mean that when they want to come out with multiple tiers of loot like oh you know it's looking at my best in slot isn't just what is crit what is determination it's what is the best effect for me or what enhances my playstyle, or what complements my playstyle. For example, maybe some sort of barred bow that decreases the cast time while in Wanderer's Minuet by 0.5 seconds. You know, that would be crazy good, because that would re-enable some of the mobility. However, it would also mean that in the next raid tier, if an item that isn't the same is there, it will also mean you're forced to change playstyle. So there's a lot of pros and cons that go into it. But I definitely want gear with more unique traits. As opposed to making drops in raids, I actually want recipes to drop in raids uh not bound not recipes that are bound to you upon pickup recipes that can then be sold on the market board recipes that give raid equivalent gear and the materials for that raid equivalent gear can drop off of the bosses for example you know how bosses sometimes drop an item directly into the inventory or maybe drop some sort of additional item like the gob shielding for example uh put those in there and make it so that you can go and you can use them on the market board and there's uh money to be made by raiders in that sense and there's also a reason to be a crafter and a raider you know there's benefits fits to that there's a lot of things that go into potential ways that they could enhance the loot gaining experience and i'm hoping that around 4.0 they'll maybe start taking some chances with this and exploring because it's hard to do that in the middle of a raid tier i don't expect it before 4.0 but i am totally on your side yes i do want raid gear with unique traits set bonuses etc so good question one i completely agree with next question hey happy what's your blood type is it fucked up i don't know I actually have no idea what my blood type is. Yo, shit, I better not need a transplant anytime soon. They're going to ask me. I'm going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> Just ask someone else. I have no idea. Uh, I'd be positive. I'd be positive. I'm moving on to the next question. Next question. Hey, happy long viewer, new to your stream. Just a simple idea of mine. I hope you like it. Oh, wait, no bonus. You already have level uh, er, here. Have an early level 62 skill. I don't want any more skills to put on my hot bar. He's very kind of you, but I don't want any more skills. So lately I've got an idea of a job which based on putting dots on the ground like Shadow Flare, but you can cast them at a mob and it'll follow under them and it'll be about his size and it won't affect anyone else, but using some certain skills will let it become bigger and deal AoE damage over time, reaching some sort of limit break bar for this job like Ravana's Bloodlust. You can cast some OP ground dots. What do you think? 
Um, so I'm actually intrigued by the idea of placing a debuff on a mob, which can then be manipulated through the use of other abilities. For example, place a mark on a mob and says, uh, your certain skills will cause this mark to react in different ways. For example, if you hit the mark with one skill, it turns into a wider, a it turns into a wide AOE that deals damage over time and follows the enemy. It means that even if a mob is being kited, you can still be doing meaningful AOE damage to them. So it's almost like a an AOE placement skill that has no me has it just follows the enemy. Um, you could also have it so that the uh, mark simply explodes and it hits for additional damage. You can make it so that the mark can be transferred from target to target and the, and the transfer will deal damage to both targets. So it's less than the, than the AoE, but it's more damage when it's only two targets. Things like that that interact with some sort of unique ability, perfectly okay with. The problem is finding a job that that works okay on. Because that almost sounds like a theme that would fit the summoner better than anyone else, just based on the way they're designed in the game. Um, and it also has to have meaningful uses, like, that's, that's really the roughest thing, is findings, it has to have, mean, it has to have meaningful damage, meaningful uses, and ultimately, it's a super flexible skill, but it will always only be used for certain things in certain situations. Uh, so you have to make sure that you're not just giving the job, like, four or five useless skills in, in one situation, as opposed to giving it, like, you know, four or five useful skills in many situations. So, uh, narrowing it down to only those few situations can be rough if it was a job designed around that. And as for a personal limit break bar, I'm, I'm not for that. As far as I'm concerned, that's literally just the adrenaline bar in, in PvP, and that's that might as well just be like a one-minute cooldown ability or a two-minute cooldown ability, as opposed to it having a bar. What I am for is different forms of uh, of uh, resource management other than stacking deb uh, you know stacking buffs like you know infuriate or or uh, or abandon or uh, you know ether flow stacks where you get them all and you expend them i want to see something like an energy bar maybe a different kind of mp bars a different kind of consumption bar maybe something that stacks up uh, and it's on the actual hot bar and not on the little buff bar something along those lines i've mentioned that in a previous episode but uh, you know any idea can work i said this last week just it's just got to fit into the game's theme, and it's got to not be overpowered, it's got to not be underpowered. you got to try to find the right place for it and the right scenarios for which it and things will be used. Alright, next question. Keeping my greeting simple this week since my Sugar Hill Gang reference didn't go over so well last week. But funny how confused you were. Anyway, what's up, Mr. Happy? My question may contain spoilers, although it has more to do with the lore than the main story. Also, here's you giving a blurry thumbs up. I'm so happy you decided to include this. So anyway, I'm going to remove the... Uh, See, this is this is a perfect test. Now I can remove that and I can read the question. So when I do the thumbs up again, that means the question will be back. So in case you don't want spoilers, just mute the... Yeah, anyway. I've been pondering what exactly the 12 were and are. A lot of people seem to assume they're just the same as primals, but in events in the main story show, the primals are just twisted representations of beings that existed before. At least with almost every primal whose backstory we actually know, they have been based on a real historical figure, even if that history was shrouded in myth. Phoenix would be the exception, but I think Phoenix was kind of a weird circumstance anyway. So if the 12 existed before, what were they? My thinking is that on it, my, uh, my current thinking on it is that much like the Asians were dark servants of Zodiac, the 12 may have been similar servants to Hydaelyn. So leaves a lot of questions like they never appeared to anyone or what role the Echo played and all this so what do you think so um the 12 were actually gods that existed on the earth before the, before man inhabited uh eorzea itself i shouldn't say earth i should say eorzea or just the land um when man started uh you know appearing on eorzea then they had no problems coexisting with them until man started showing that they were willing to have wars among themselves and uh, try to gain power and territory, and the 12 didn't like it at all. The 12 basically said, yo, peace, we out, all the stuff we do for this world is no more. You guys are responsible for this world now. And they just peace, and that's the first Umbral Era. Now, almost all of the Umbral Eras are a result of the rejoining, which means that the Asians may have even brought man to Eorzea in the first place in order to try and bring back Zodiark by, in, by getting these wars to go on and forcing the Twelve to leave so that Zodiark could re-inhabit the land. It ended up not working, apparently, because we're now working on, what, we've had seven rejoinings? Or no, we're, we're uh, is it seven rejoinings? We're in the seventh Umbral, we're in the seventh Astral Era right now, right? So that means we already had our seventh Umbral Era. So, um, yeah, we've had seven rejoinings at this point, and they're trying to bring about the eighth rejoining. Uh, and so, the Twelve are just, outside of that, I don't really know what they are, like, what they were represented as, but they were obviously very important, and they used to walk the Earth. Uh, the fact that they now answer to man's prayer is kind of odd, maybe some sort of respect for them for bringing the world back up from this ruined Umbral Era. 
Um, they probably also just don't like the bad guys. So <laughs> they're probably willing to help us if we ask. There's, if we were to summon one, it would probably be similar to a primal, like actual, excuse me, actually full on summon uh, a physical form of the 12. But it seems that Louis Soi's, um interaction with them in the in the original trailer for Realm Reborn, as well as the turn 12 cutscene, Seems to like say that even when even when using Ether to summon them, they don't seem to have malicious intent. They just do what the asker is, uh, you know, what the the person summoning them is asking them to do. Uh, whether or not that's a good thing, I don't know. But they're clearly not bad guys, or at least not bad guys by our perspective. Of course, the Asians look at the twelve and they're like, "Yo, I hate those guys." But um, what they exactly are, no idea. That's just the best history I can give you on what we know about the twelve. Next question. Hey, Mr. Happy. Greetings from Australia. As I mentioned, I live in uh, Aussie. Or uh, Oz. Or Oz. Australia? We'll just say Australia. <laughs> you don't live in Aussie. Aussie is the name. <laughs> I play in the European Data Center because I have friends there who I like to play with. As a result, my ping is like 350, 400. Yeah. While it's not impossible to play with that much ping, it's incredibly frustrating. It makes endgame content extremely difficult to do. I'm hesitant to get into raiding of any kind or attempt anything other than hard mode primals. As a DPS, I find that I'm constantly dying to AoEs I cannot avoid due to my latency, and I hate being such a burden. I want to know your stance on uh, Australia or Oceanic server and why Screenix isn't looking to implement one. Also, do you have any tips with dealing with high latency as moving to another server isn't an option as a reduction in ping is minuscule? Well, you have uh, you have uh, programs like What the Fast, you have uh, Battle Ping, Ping Zapper, all of those. You may want to tr start trying those out and seeing which ones work. Uh, the only one I think that has like a full-on free trial is What the Fast, but it only works partially, so I don't know if that's going to help. And even that's still at most, at the, at the least, is going to bring your ping down to like 150, 200, which I believe is a playable amount, as frustrating as it can be um as for why square enix hasn't done yet none of interest over there like they have china and they have korea at this point which are all closed gaming communities it doesn't seem that they've gauged enough of an interest from those areas to implement a data center second of all european data center doesn't even exist yet so until the european one exists it's hard to think they would look into oceanic and australia although yoshi p has expressed concerns that there are quite a few people from australia that play and simply don't have the option most of them seem to be trying to play on japanese servers to get the least amount of latency but even that is only going so far when it comes to playing uh from australia because then you have to deal with a language barrier so there's a lot of things that need to be overcome i don't know if they'll be overcome anytime soon but that's probably the reason square enix hasn't looked into it all too much just yet all right next question hey haps i've been debating leaving 14 for a break as i'm finding myself getting burned out understandable I usually log in and count my esoterics on Thursday or Friday if I get lucky with my Alex drops. I have a raid group that goes into Alex each weeknight for two hours with A1 Savage on farm, and apart from logging in to play with my girlfriend in the evenings, I don't find I have much I enjoy doing. I tried switching doing content from my monk to a summoner and a warrior, but it doesn't help keep me too interested. So I'm looking for a new MMO to try for a few weeks or so. Let me just scroll down here. Uh, I used to play WoW and Go Wars 2 and have no interest in returning to them, and the combat system in Terra puts me off at around level 24. I was wondering what games you'd recommend trying. I want to stick with MMOs doing due to being able to play with people i don't mind sub costs or buying a base game well lucky for you i have a solution for both we have wildstar which is going free to play on september 29th if you buy it now there is you i it ha, it's currently live with a sub and you can start leveling like an actual character also you could try out the closed beta server which would uh which I'd imagine would be okay. It's just that the character's not going to transfer over to the live game. You just have to keep that in mind. Um, and Wildstar was a game I heavily criticized before when it first came out. The leveling did not like it. The 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 way they approached hardcore endgame, while it was good for those who liked hardcore endgame, it isn't a very profitable way to approach the game to only cater to the hardcore and i've been playing it on level 16 on the closed beta because i want to play the free-to-play version i'm not interested in the live version i'm interested in the free-to-play version i wanted to see what changes they've made and so far i've been largely happy with the changes they made the level 10 dungeon that is literally designed to teach you the game and even then still doesn't really pull any punches it still has things like you know dodging aoe's it has mechanics it has enrage timers it has uh it has uh, DPS checks, like it's all that in a level 10 dungeon, but it's still overcomable and it does it makes you think, wow, I can't wait to see what the next dungeon is. Uh, they have plenty of other uh, instance content, PvP, expeditions, adventures, all of that, and honestly, I've been enjoying it. It's not enough to make it a main game for me, but it's a game I feel like I can comfortably, after it goes free to play, jump into, level a little bit, do some content, and be happy and play it at a slower pace, which is something, I which is something that I liked about Final Fantasy XIV. If I only had three hours a day, I could still get a lot done.
Uh, and then you also have Blade and Soul, which is largely a PvP game, but it does have a PvE element that is entirely skill -based. Both the PvE and PvP are both largely skill-based, and I'm going to be playing that as well. The closed beta for that starts on October 30th, and if you buy a Founders Pack on the Blade and Soul website, you can get guaranteed access to that on October 30th. Um, so those are both really good choices. Blade and Soul is very fast-paced, very reactive, very, very skill-intensive. Whereas Wildstar, yes, it is skill-intensive, there is dodging, it is more active combat system, but it still feels like it's a more approachable game. I'm interested to see if Blade and Soul feels like an approachable game when I actually get my, my hands on it on October 30th. So anyway, uh, those are my two recommendations, and if you ever want to see them, come by my stream. I've been streaming Wildstar lately. I've been streaming some, uh, I will be streaming Blade and Soul in the near future, so... Come check it out or look up some videos. I think it'll definitely see be something that piques your interest. Next question, new poster and new player. As someone who started after Heaven's Word was released, I'm wondering, with the new level 60 cap, is level 50 conti content still relevant to level 60 players? I'm interested in running many of them from story to experience standpoint. I'm wondering if there's anything to reward endgame players for going back and doing coils or World of Darkness. Second question, if the issue with the D&D game... <laughs> D&D game, Astrologian. Uh, I don't know. If, oh, you mean end game. d and I was thinking because rolling dice. I'm sorry. I, it's made sense either way. Is there randomness? Uh, would a possible fix be to add a gambler motive to the class, give them the ability to cheat at a price? Cheat fate, bottom draw, stack the deck. That's a lot of extra abilities to add. And even then, uh, they can only do that once in a while. That couldn't be something they could do super, super often. Um, they're not really gamblers, is the thing. You know, they just pull a card from a deck. I mean, that is, that's a weird feature for them to have. It makes sense to draw tarot cards, like you think about when that's probably where it gets its, like, inspiration. But even then, it's like, then, I don't understand why it's just, it feels like the Spire and the Ur get drawn way too much. It feels like the percentages of the, the, of uh, your likeliness to draw the cards is not even. It probably is, as even as six cards can be, or 12 cards, if it's actually a deck with two cards each. But, ugh. Even just one ability to, to guarantee one card pick every, like, two minutes would do wonders for the job. Um, and as for the level 50 content, people do it for glamour, for mounts, but that's about it. Other than that, it's not really relevant. Most people just undersize it, get their clears, get the story, and get the hell out and go back and do level 60 stuff. Uh, 3.1 should bring a lot more level 60 content. It's almost the same as A Realm Reborn was when it launched. 2.0 literally had three hard mode primals, two expert dungeons, and four raid bosses. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The only difference is we have more ways to go about getting things like law tunnels. Sounds like we have hunts now. We have maps. We all the features carried over. It's just that the uh, the actual content you're doing on a weekly basis is limited because it's mostly Savage or Alexander normal. Um, so I would say just if you want to farm some level 50 content, maybe find some people. But it's not something people do hardcore. You're not gonna find groups that are solely dedicated to doing level 50 content. Alright, next question, repost from week 56. Hey Haps, I have a few questions for you. Let's get right to it. I like this. What are you most looking forward to in 3.1 or 3.x? Or 3.1x, like 3.1, 3.15? Probably the Free Company airships. I want to see what they can do that's different, you know? And also Lords of Verminion, because, let's be honest, StarCraft in Final Fantasy XIV, that's pretty much what it is. So I'm looking forward to it. What's your favorite food? I try to ask one light question just to keep it interesting. The first question was also pretty light. Uh, steak. I love steak. Ah, I'm like a carnivore. Sorry, vegetarians out there. Just my personal preference. You guys do your thing. Uh, although the question itself is short and may take a long time to answer, you can use this as material for your next video commentary. I'm not sure if you get this question a lot, but if you could design one tank, one melee, one range caster, and one healer, how would they basically play? You don't need to give specifics, but keep it general. Oh, then this is going to be a quick question. Uh, tank that uh, tanks from a range. I know that sounds stupid, but I want to take that as a lot of ranged tools. Dark Knight has some, but like literally they have like, instead of just short range with a few long range abilities give them a ton of abilities that have a 15 to one yom range and then you can design bosses that maybe uh, that have you know things that move slower or tanks that uh t just being able to tank ads and do reliable kiting dps or uh enmity generation one melee i would probably pick puppet master which or beast master i was a melee pet job they have a pet that they command they give controls and not like the same way they give the summoner uh commands the summoner gives their pets controls uh you know different pets with different abilities for different scenarios something that's flexible same with both puppet master and beast master just being able to adjust to the situation and being able to give commands in sort of a broad spectrum you know you don't just actually click the button on a pet hot bar so that way it has a little bit less of that pet interaction um you actually just are able to give it basic uh commands such as you know you know i want you to be aggressive or i want you to be defensive and that sort of changes the way that its abilities work you can set up sort of a gambit system with it in the uh in the hot bars i would like something like that 
As for, I should probably scroll down so it's actually on screen. Uh, as for um, ranged or caster, give me, my, I, fuck it, just give me, give me red mage. Like everyone wants red mage. I think everyone's gonna be complaining that red mage isn't exactly like it was in Final Fantasy XI, or it's not exactly the way they wanted. It. It's such a controversial job and the way people want it to be played. So I'm gonna say, just make it red mage. Make it do something. I don't know. I kind of want it to be more melee than ranged caster, but. Just or do Geomancer. Go Geomancer, where they can uh, they can create fields that give different buffs, and that's their big thing. So they can have, they have like three different fields. One of them does this, another one does that. They can only have one out at a time, uh, and then they can also manipulate the ground, have different effects and debilitating effects on the enemy. Sort of like the thing we were talking about before with the mark that uh, you place on the target. And as for one healer, I don't know what healer it would be, because I also actually thought of Geomancer as a healer, where you do da you heal by doing damage. That's like your big thing. So for those people that do like DPSing and healing at the same time, it's literally a job designed for that, and that is the sole mastery point for it. It would just make a lot of sense with the way the game plays right now. Instead of needing to be like, you can either go full bone DPS, DPS and heal, or heal, as opposed to just like cleric stance on and off. You have three stances, one of which is full DPS with no healing, one of them cuts back to DPS but adds healing, and then you have full blown healing. That way you can contribute in multiple ways meaningfully. I just, it would be flexible, probably be overpowered, but that's what I would like. Hopefully, that was a good answer to your question. Let's move on to the next one. Next question. Hey, Mr. Happy, first time poster, so have yourself a sweet esoterics bonus and some cookies. My question is, I've been maining ninja since it came out, and I want to start raiding on Summoner, but I have no raid experience with it. What would you recommend I do to get more raid experience? At least do Alexander Normal. I mean, the best way to get raid experience is to raid with it. So, unless you're just jumping into Savage. First of all, make sure you know your rotation, test it on a dummy. Second of all, make sure you can use that rotation and react to simple mechanics in Alexander Normal. You know, nothing too fancy, but at least you show that you can maintain damage while reacting to mechanics when something is actually hitting you back. Um, and then you go into Savage, and you still need to relearn it more. It's going to have some growing pains, but that's your best bet, man. Hopefully you enjoy Summoner. It's a good job. They did some good things with it in the expansion. Enjoy it, and good luck practicing your... gaining your raid experience. Next question... All right, next question. Hello, Mr. Happy. One question and one fun fact. How would you feel if they somehow put Red Mage and Blue Mage in one job like Summer Scholar? No, I don't want that ever again. Like, it was great to get two jobs for the price of one, but unfortunately, that has led to more problems than it has good. So, I'm going to say no, and wow, it's getting pretty windy out there. I'm going to just go ahead and say I'll pass. Sorry. But the one fun fact, I don't know why it's spoiler for Hidden if it's just a fun fact. Fun fact, Scholar isn't affected by the healing debuff in A3. Etherflow, hashtag Lustrate, hashtag Indomitability. Is it a bug or just thank you, Square Enix? Um, if it's, if it's not affecting those, those are abilities, not spells. If, I'd have to read the debuff, but if the debuff says reduces the efficiency of healing spells, then it's possible it's just not programmed into abilities, which are different. Those are, you know... Those don't cost MP, they may cost something else, and they are usually off the global cooldown. I have to read the debuff again, but uh, that actually may be intentional. Um, if not, if it's supposed to, if it, I guess the real question is, and I need a white mage to answer it, does it reduce, an, uh, does it reduce uh, Tetragrammaton, Tetra from white mage? If it doesn't, then it's intentional. If it does, then it's a bug that it doesn't affect Lustrator and Dominability. Uh, one that they are going to find out right now and go fix. Next question. Hey, Mr. Happy, first time poster, so have yourself a sweet esoteric bonus. I just want to know what you take on Monk DPS versus all the other DPS. Monk DPS is solid. I have no issue with Monk DPS at all. And honestly, with the amount of gear that's available now through esoterics, at least if you've been somebody who's been asking very often, there's no real reason for a static to be upset that, oh, we have a monk instead of a dragoon or a monk instead of a ninja. It's like, until you get into A4 Savage, like, even then, as long as you're playing well, you should beat it. It's going to come down to the player more than the composition. Is there a best composition? Something that is mathematically better? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure, there is. But that being said, unless you're on the cutting edge of progression, just play, take the player, not the job. Just don't stack jobs that's still something i have a thing against but like don't be afraid to bring a paladin and a monk in a composition as opposed to a dark knight dragoon or a dark knight ninja whatever just do the content monk dps very good very very good when done correctly very very good next question hello sir happy first time poster enjoy the bonus don't worry i'm just a healer 
So I made it back into the game, just blowing funds, and I was wondering which ranged DPS would you recommend, Black Mage Summoner or Bar Machinist? I'm not huge on melee DPS, and I dread on playing Dragoon, because as that is. But I also play all of these on and off when I don't feel like playing a healer, and I just want to run around and kill stuff a bit faster and work on a sub job. I feel like one of the two casters would fit more my playstyle because I play a caster already, but I was wondering what's your input on this. Also, what do you think of having a race that is female only and a race that is male only? I'm gonna know we had that in Final Fantasy 11 and they literally undid that because all everybody would ask is when are we getting female this when are we getting male that because <clears throat> even if you explain that they may reproduce asexually people still go like there has to be no I want a female one or I want a male one so it's more trouble than it's worth with a community than anything else um as for which DPS try summoner I think Summoner would be a good thing. A little bit more mobile. Uh, Black Mage has the growing pains of not only being a turret, which is normal, that was the same at 50, but the Enochian timers are really annoying. I think you'll enjoy Summoner a little bit more. If you're not going to go with Summoner, I would otherwise recommend Machinist, but Machinist has some real growing pains and some really bad RNG if you get unlucky, so I'm going to say Summoner. Summoner is my recommendation for you, my friend. Oh, hey, found a Unicode Moogle. Maybe I should put that on the side. Next question. Hello, Mr. Happy. Yet again, you have the honor of a first-time poster. So I have a Shickle Larva Mini... Oh. You play Final Fantasy XI, I see. Ever since hearing of the job Astro Lotion, I want to switch my main from White Mage to this new Stargazing job. Now that I'm switched, I'm loving it, even with all the hate it received. Though when I saw it at first, I thought it'd be able to Stance Dance. Of course, that's not the case. My question is, I think it would be a bad idea to make Stance Dance able to be done mid-combat, but when you switch, there's a 15-second cooldown like Warriors Defines Deliverance. I understand why Circle Enix... For those of you who don't know that joke, that's a joke about how all the arenas they design are circles. <laughs> Did the stance lock, but I think it would add more strategy and utility to the job. Also, sticky regen for White Mage Asylum. Astro, can I get it? Why not our... Wait, Astro can get it, so why not our... Oh, you mean so you want, like, if somebody walks into the Asylum, they keep it even if they leave? They would have to get a serious nerf if that was the case. Um... So I'm kind of against the whole stance dancing with Scholar, because ultimately... It doesn't, it doesn't make the job better, it makes it more convenient. Because ultimately, if you're running Astrologian Scholar, you will never switch to that stance. But if you're running Astro White Mage, you would pretty much only switch to Nocturnal when you needed a shield. Otherwise, you're just being better than Diurnal, like Diurnal is. So it's it's literally, it's such a limited use case, because you're if you're main Nocturnal, if you're running with White Mage Astro, and they're asking you to main Nocturnal, like, you're probably going to just want to stick Nocturnal anyway, because you have the shield at your disposal at all times. Yes, I understand the AoE regen is sometimes more desirable, but you're literally only switching for one or two spells and switching back to what your main function is anyway. So I'm more of the... I'm more on the side that that's not what needs changing on Astrologian. It's just the RNG aspect that makes it hard on progression. Can it be done? Absolutely. Is it fun to do? Sometimes. Because if you draw the Spire 20 times in a row and your, your party is going, why did we do such shit damage this fight? Why did we not get a single balance? Why was there nothing at all from the Astro? And he just goes, I drew the Spire so many times. I can't. I'm sorry. I have no control. That's where I feel like the issue may lie. That's unfortunate that that's the sole issue, is that it's an unreliable job. And this will not fix that, unfortunately. Alright, so you guys know how I said earlier, like, I tend to read through the first line. I've actually read through this entire question before accepting it, and it might take one... It might be one that takes a little bit more time to explain. I may have to do a separate video about it altogether. Um, but we'll see about that. I want to at least give a, a sort of answer here. So hello, Happy. A personal slash dark question for you. My sport, my story and motivation behind the question. Could you read it off camera? It was kind of long. Okay, I'm going to do that again right now to make sure that I get it done exactly. I'm going to take this person's um, I'm going to take this person's advice. I've already read through it once, but I'll do it again just right now to make sure I don't miss anything. All right. So at the end of reading that story, and that is the second time I've read it through. The question is, have you ever gone through depression or have you ever been Mr. Unhappy? If so, what kept you through it all? I don't know. I've I've been just I've had depression described to me by people who have been diagnosed with depression. And it's not as simple as feeling upset or just not feeling good. Like it's it's like a deep-seated feeling like you don't belong in a place or you know everything around you isn't working or it, it's like a deep-seated feeling and it's not something that you can literally just say, "Oh, well I won't do that." It's something where you like you really have to 
have somebody pull you out of it. It's 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 something that's so hard to conquer alone. And in my opinion, like things like this, like they try to give people meds for depression and just th that's just covering up an issue. Th those things don't actually make you happier. They just set off like blasters in your brain that that promote positive energy as opposed to negative energy. Um, so I don't know if I've ever been fully into depression. I've had tough times in my life, though. I mean, I, you you guys come in and you see me as Mr. Happy all the time, but I'm also just Mike, you know? Like, I have my rough times. I have my breakdowns. I have the times where I look at what I do, my YouTube and my Twitch, and I go, man, how long does this last? You know, like, how long can I really keep this up? How long will people watch me? Are people still going to be watching me a year from now, or two years from now, five years from now? Where will my life be in those times? You know, all of those things, they weigh on your mind as a streamer and a broadcaster. And uh, the only thing that I could say keeps me going through it all is the people who I think wouldn't care any less. Like, I've had those points in my life where I thought nobody would care if I disappeared, you know? I've had those thoughts before, um, and it, it honestly, it took telling those people that I felt that way and hearing their side of it. Now, not everyone has a favorable response to hearing that, you know, to hearing that because people sometimes get offended when you think that they don't care about your life because they've shown you in the past that they do care about you and they do care about the things that happen in your life. So. Uh, it's not always a good reaction, but letting those people know how you're feeling and not just cutting off ties is probably the biggest thing that helped me because a lot then the, even just the feeling of someone cheering you up it's not always enough to bring you out of depression but it at least gives you this momentary feeling of positivity and like you make an impact on someone's life if I th like that's my thing I just want to make an impact on someone's life it's it's not it's for it's it's not just for me it's it's mostly for them um, but I have to say that like helping people, doing charity events, you know, when people come in and they say thank you and, uh, you know, people come and they watch my stream every hello, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder, it's, it's, it's motivation, it's something that keeps me going, you know, on top of the support that I get from my family, my friends, my girlfriend, you know, them supporting my decision to do this. Uh, you need to find uh, people to talk to, the people that you've been trying to cut ties with, you need to try, really try to reconnect those ties, rekindle those friendships. Because these people, whether or not you think they were ever going to be there for you or they ever were there for you, they were and actually probably still are your friends, even after the stuff that you may have said to them or may have gone through. They just need to know who they're really talking to. And it's not an easy thing, but sometimes opening up is the ultimate way of, uh, of just letting it all go uh it's really hard for me to give advice because like i said i don't know if i've ever been full-on depressed i've probably just had that high school thing where you think you're depressed but you're really just upset about something you know i don't know if it's ever really been beyond that i just think that you need to involve yourself in a community a community that makes you feel good and don't go over the top with it you know don't try to do these crazy things and garnish you know positive emotions from everyone you interact with just Find the people that you can affect the most in life in a way that makes you feel self-fulfilled and also treat those people really well. I'd say that that is definitely something you'll have to do to help you get through these hard times. Don't try to do it alone. As hard as it may be, do not try to do it alone. You have a community here. You have the Final Fantasy XIV community. You have your friends that you met in the game. You have the people that you may know in real life. You have people out there who care about you. So make sure that you don't Sever those connections, and if you already have, then try to rekindle them. That's honestly the best advice I have. Um, if it's really, really bad, I highly recommend you go see someone who specialized in this thing. I am just a personality. I am just somebody on the internet with no sort of formal certification. And I highly recommend that you take the advice of someone who does have formal certification in this topic. That will probably help you way more. This is just my opinion on what can help you the most. All right, here's another question that I've read ahead of time. Uh, hey, Mr. Happy, greetings from Taiwan. No, I'm not Taiwanese, American. First time poster here, so SO bonus for you. And let me start off by saying I watch a lot of your guys that have helped me. Solo Cure, through most of the Binding Coil of Bahamut, even if the Japanese servers do things a bit differently. So big thank you, and I have a bowl of homemade ginger gelato with apples and caramels. <gasps> okay, I've actually read your question because it was very long ahead of time. I went to scroll past, I was like, holy moly, I need to do this. So I'm going to quickly scroll through. I have one question with a bit of background. I'm on my quest to get all my jobs to 60. Uh, I was all at 50 by 2.1 or 2.2. Once I began soul searching from one job I really enjoy, 
and I, which I have yet to find, to be honest. So I default to my white mage. My problem I'm finding is I'm finding tanking extremely scary leveling in Heaven's Word dungeons, and I'm wondering if I'm doing something wrong. Like, I take a lot of damage, even when I use one of my defensive cooldowns. Uh, your gear is decent. I'm sitting around I-130 with a mash of the different, excuse me, gear. As a white mage, generally hate letting my tank dip below 50%. I cast stone skin between each of my three holy casts and turn clerics on and off as I arrow stone three aside, etc. I sync myself get so low so fast makes me wonder, am I just doing something wrong? Or am I being too self-conscious? Perhaps my healers have not been taking as good a care of me. That's probably the result. Your healers are probably taking not taking good enough care of you. And here's the thing. It's very common for healers to let a tank fall below 50% HP. It's it's actually very common. Um, most of the time what you'll do is as a white mage, I see this, you throw it, you start the fight, divine seal, uh, regen, asylum if you really want to, if there's a lot of damage going out, and then you go full ham, cleric stance, arrow three, holy, 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 with shroud of saints mixed in there. If the tank starts getting low, he starts dipping, guess what, turn it off. Uh, you can choose to either do the healing asides or the DPS asides. You, know, you throw out the asides, you refresh his regen, you make sure that that, uh, you make sure you have a Tetra save for them, and then you just go back to DPSing, and you make sure that they're just constantly generating health over time. In the leveling up dungeons, you're no longer overgeared for dungeons. That's a big thing to remember. Tanks pull as if they're still super OP in level 50 dungeons. Not the case for a lot of tanks. If you're doing that, that might be part of the issue. But if you're tanking the packs, like one pack at a time, it could just be a healer trying to pull out some extra DPS or not taking good enough care of you. Just as long as you're using your cooldowns correctly, you're keeping your gear up to date, I think you're doing fine, buddy. Also, you said you're horribly indecisive, so I should pick your next 60 for you. Astrologian. I'm so sorry that that had to be my choice, but it definitely had to be. Oh, wait. Yeah, you don't have Astrologian at... You have Astrologian at 58. I'm saying do your Astrologian. You got two levels left. So I think you're good to go. Anyway, thanks for your question. Next question. What's up, Happy? I'm back with the qu I'm back on the question thread. So I have returning bonus of some kind. How about some sweet poetics? No. Give me an encrypted tombstone for leveling my ninja. Anyway, my question. Do you happen to wonder what goblins look like under their masks? It's been on my mind recently. I feel like they look like goblins from past games. I'm pretty sure someone would think they have... Yeah, I think they probably just look like old school goblins. Like, you've seen a goblin in Harry Potter. You've seen a goblin in any sort of fantasy novel or movie. Yeah, because you see it in the book. You... you, you they describe them usually. Um, I'm sure they just look like regular goblins. They got masks on though, because they because they look hideous and they they gotta look cool, so they got masks on and stuff. All right, so this next question I read uh, is I read it ahead of time because it was very long. I wanted to uh, to shorten it down. So. Uh, Asking first time poster, long time watcher. Oh, I totally recognize your username, man. That's why I stopped and tried to take the question into account. Uh, here's some SO bonus and a dream network bonus as we first post on the network, all right? Whatever dream network bonus is, thank you. This question involves rating, so it may seem long, uh, so I'll italicize the important part of the question. Yes, yeah, so I already read through, and he's having some trouble with frame rate issues because he doesn't run on a strong computer. But he's running with a raid group. They like him, they want to keep him, but he feels bad uh, holding them back. The question is, do you know any way you can increase your frame rate with the situation? Do I tell the group to try to find another tank, or do I still try to give it another go? So you say you run the game on graphics settings low on DX9, but you don't mention if you play it on borderless, windowed, borderless, or full screen. That's the next big thing. Try all three different ones. For example, I can't play on borderless windowed. It just completely destroys everything. Either the screen is tearing or the frame rate is horrible. Bordered works really well for me because I can actually move my mouse cursor off and do other things while the game is up. A uh, full screen works, but I, it just doesn't have that same usability. Since you're running on a laptop, which is only one screen, try bordered full screen. Make sure you're not borderless windowed. Otherwise, like you said, it is a low end laptop i don't really know how you can improve your performance otherwise other than maybe making sure that there's not a lot of programs running simultaneously hopefully this helps all right guys i'm going to answer two more questions and then we're going to wrap it up i only have about 10 more minutes so i want to make sure that i get this done in time uh but anyway thank you again for your questions this week be sure to ask your questions for next week if my, your question isn't one of these next two i think i need to sneeze real quick no we're good anyway next question hey mr happy it's been a while since i've asked a question on here so take 100 law Sure, I'm capped, but whatever. You might not remember me. I remember your name, dude. I don't forget a lot. I, I forget some names, but that's not a name I forget. But anyway, I got two quick questions for you, but if you can only answer one, choose the second one, please. Question one, is Black Mage better than Summoner and A4 Savage DPS-wise, or any of, any of the other floors besides A2 Savage? I think A1 and A2 belong to Summoner, and I think A3 and A4 belong to Black Mage in terms of efficiency. Not that Summoner can't do those fights, they can't do them well, but I feel like they really bring out the best in Black Mage. They show having these big one-off numbers, wh why they're so useful and why it's useful having them so often. So that's my answer for that one. Yes, I do think Black Mage is better than Summoner. However, I'm sure there's some perfectly good Summoners out there who will prove me wrong at some point. So I hope you prove me wrong soon. 
Question number two, is Astrologian, Diurnal Sect, Scholar Healer better combo than White Mage Scholar combo? Now the new Astro Changes? No. It's just an acceptable other option, in my opinion. Um, just White Mage is so good. Like, yeah, it, it, it's it's not better. Let's just say that. Uh, before I get into a rant about Astrologian, it's not better. Let's just say that. It's just another option. And it's, I believe, the preferred option over White Mage Astro with Nocturnal. I'm pretty sure that's the more preferred option to have the Diurnal Scholar combo. All right, and the last question is the third time it's being reposted. The person made sure I noticed it in bold, in bold uh, words. Third repost. Hello, Mr. Happy. Play this game mainly for the story, and I use Black Mage. Problem is, 50% of the time, I keep getting kicked out of dungeons. I'm always friendly and always say hi, but they don't even say anything and they kick me. Some people on FC told me it's because I don't use enough fire and people want fast runs, but I don't get it. Why don't we play this game because it's fun? Then why do we want it over faster? So anyway, when I try fire out, I'm out of mana in no time. I don't see how that helps me do more damage. Instead, I'm using Thunder on all the targets. I spam Blizzard if it's one target. All right, so let me tell you, fire is your main dps stance the entire point of black mage is to cast a few fires then switch back to blizzard form using blizzard 3 then reapply your thunder and then use fire 3 to get back into fire so it's a dance between fire and uh, fire and ice fire and ice that is exactly how you have to play it. if you go full ice it's not going to fly. People are going to keep kicking you from dungeons because that is an extremely inefficient way to play the job. I hate, hate that to be harsh, but it is the bottom line. What I usually do, and I see this quite often, I let the person know. I don't just kick them outright. I say, hey man, just so you know, you're supposed to be moving between fire and ice. And I don't even try to explain the full thing where I say, oh, you know, fire three, fire, 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 you know, blizzard three, thunder one or thunder two, fire three when you're at full MP. Like, I don't even try to explain all that. I literally just tell them, Use your MP and fire until you only have enough for one Blizzard 3, then switch to ice using Blizzard 3, cast one of your Thunder spells, usually Thunder 1 or Thunder 2 because the cast times are shorter, maybe an extra Blizzard 1, and then switch back using fire 3. Fire, you have to be in that stance to put out good damage, and people will ridicule you and they will kick you from dungeons if you do not make this adjustment. Um, so, like I said, I'm not giving you the perfect rotation. I'm not giving you the full rotation. But not running out of mana is not the same as doing a good amount of damage. So just to let you know, um, it's not even that you're not doing a super perfect rotation. You're ignoring the primary aspect of your job. That is the biggest thing. Fire form is the primary damage stance for your job. And yes, while people should be playing the game to have fun, uh, it's not even that it's getting over faster, it's getting it done efficiently, you know? You do, it's not even that, it's not like they want the dungeon to be slower because they want the rewards at the end. Uh, they've done this dungeon a bunch of times before, they've completed it, you know, they just want to get it done. And also, as a player, you need to uh, be willing to improve yourself as you're leveling up. Take in your new skills and understand why did they give this skill to my job? I feel like I have infinite MP. Why was I given these skills that use so much MP, put me at zero, and then I don't know what to do? You need to look at the whole picture and not just think, that's a half of the job I don't need to pay attention to. Just gotta change your outlook. Just practice going between fire and ice by casting fire three when your MP is full to get to the fire stance and then using your fire ones in single target or fire twos in AOEs. And, and then when you're low on MP, try to learn how many casts it take you to get to the point where you could only have enough MP for a blizzard three and then start worrying about your thunder cast and all that. Hopefully that helps you out. If you have a follow-up question, ask it in the comment section under the video, not in the Dream Network forums. Anyway, thank you everyone for watching this video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And again, ask your questions for next week on the Dream Network forums in the description of the video below. Should be the, what, week 58 questions? Right, damn, it's already been six, almost six weeks as of next week since the one-year anniversary of the show. Anyway, thank you for watching. Remember to give me feedback on all of this, and I will see you all in the next episode. Until then, take care. Thank you.